I love sports movies. Maybe some of you love them too. Here's just a few of my favorites. Remember the Titans with Denzel Washington, attitude reflect leadership, Captain. Or how about Field of Dreams with Kevin Costner? If you build it, he will come. Or maybe The Sandlot, you're killing me, Smalls. But right at the top of that list is a movie called Chariots of Fire, which came out in 1981. And when I found that out, well, it made me feel old. And to this day, when I hear the theme music from Chariots of Fire, it just makes me want to run in slow motion. If you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. But Chariots of Fire tells the real life story of a man named Eric Little, who was a Scottish rugby star and sprinter who won a gold medal in the 1924 Paris Olympic Games. Now, Little was a committed Christian man, and he famously refused to run in the heat of the 100-meter dash, which was his specialty, because it was held on a Sunday in Paris. Instead, he ran the 400, which was not his specialty, and still won a gold medal. But after achieving Olympic fame, and this may be part of his story you don't know, uh, Little spent the rest of his life as a missionary in China. And during World War II, he was interred in a Japanese prison camp, but continued serving and ministering to his fellow prisoners until he eventually suffered a brain tumor and died in that concentration camp in 1945. But there's a scene early in that movie that really is my favorite part of the movie. It's a race that takes place about a year before the Olympics in 1923, when shortly after this race began, he was pushed off the track and fell into the infield, into the grass. Uh, but he got up and not only started running and finished the race, but with his trademark sort of furious running style, he made up that distance and he actually won that race. And I think that's almost exactly what the writer of Hebrews is trying to tell us today. As Stetson mentioned moments ago, we are wrapping up our summer-long series uh, from Hebrews chapter 11 called By Faith. And if you'll remember, Hebrews is a letter written to Jewish background followers of Jesus in the first century who are facing discrimination and increasing persecution, and they're struggling to hang on to their faith. And the author begins chapter 11 by just defining faith for us. He says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And then we're guided through what might be called um, an Old Testament hall of faith, where there's a whole list of ancient men and women who the author holds up a, of, uh, as examples of what it looks like to live by faith. And as we've gone through the series... We've seen that it means different things at different times. We've seen themes along the way emerge. Like, for example, the journey of faith is often long and hard and sometimes kind of messy. That God uses ordinary people, sometimes very flawed people, to accomplish his redemptive purpose. That living by faith sometimes results in, in great victories and even miracles. But at other times, living by faith means enduring great suffering and hardship. Finally, last week we saw that all these examples of faith died without ever receiving the promise, the writer says. Now, the promise, of course, we know was the promise of Messiah, a Savior, a Deliverer, the promise of Jesus that we know about clearly today. We come now to the summary statement of chapter 11, which actually comes to us in the first two verses of chapter 12. Let me read them for you. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. I think we see four things here. We'll try to cover them today. Remember, remove, run, and refocus. We'll begin with remember. I'm sure a lot of you watching uh, this today have been to Wrigley Field for a Cubs game at one time or another. You know, the friendly confines, the Ivy, Rizzo, Bryant, and Bi well, well, wait, they're not there anymore. Or maybe some of you have been to Soldier Field uh, for a Bears game, and you're, maybe you're planning on going to a game this season if you enjoy paying good money in order to suffer. But back in 2017, the year after the Cubs won the World Series, remember that? Doesn't seem like a long, long time ago. 
But in the year after, 2017, the Cubs made the playoffs again. Uh, and one of my sons and I decided to go down to Wrigley Field just to sort of share in the excitement. We couldn't actually get tickets to the game, but our plan was just to hang out in that park that's just outside the stadium and watch on this gr giant screen they have set up there. So we watched the game that day with all the other poor souls that couldn't get a ticket to the game. But what surprised me and what really made it fun is that even though we were outside the stadium, when something would happen in the game, we could hear the roar of the crowd from inside the stadium. So it actually felt like we were inside the stadium with everyone else. Now, most of us have wondered a time or two what it would be like to be on the field or in the game and to hear the roar of the crowd. And I often think of Hebrews 12 at a time like that. The writer says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Many scholars think there's good reason to think that the ancient writer here is imagining a, a large stadium filled with spectators. Now, we know from archaeology that large sports arenas are not unique to our modern culture. Here's a photo of the ruins of an ancient hippodrome in a place called Caesarea Maritima, about 70 miles northwest of Jerusalem. My wife and I visited here a few years ago when we traveled to the Holy Land. Now, this particular stadium included a, a track for chariot races or foot races and could seat upwards of 20,000 people. And it's possible... It's possible that the author of Hebrews actually had visited this ancient arena. Now, the author is picturing a great cloud gather because he writes, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, the word cloud here in the ancient Greek was a word that had a couple of different meanings. It was used to refer to a, a great crowd of people, but also uh, as sort of a slang way of using the word. It referred to the highest seats in a stadium. Uh, as, uh, as in uh, our seats are up in the cloud today, or like we might say today, we have nosebleed section seats. So the images of a stadium uh, that's packed right to the top row, uh, full of what the author calls witnesses. Now, who is he talking about here? The word witnesses is the ancient word martyrion, from which we get our English word martyr. In other words, the author is saying, remember all those faithful witnesses who've gone before. And in the context of chapter 11, that means the people we've looked at all summer long. Noah and Abraham and Moses and Rahab and Gideon and Samson and David and all the others. We've seen that by faith, some accomplished great things. We also saw that by faith, others endured great suffering. Many of them had personal lives marked by by flaws and failures, and yet were greatly used by God because of their faith. Now, the author here is talking about people who lived out lives of faith and faithfulness, who finished the race of faith, and now they fill a kind of a great spiritual stadium right to the very last row, and they're watching us as we run our race. So here's a question for you to think about. Who are the, who are the witnesses in your cloud. Of course, there are all those who have gone before, the, the, the people mentioned in Hebrews 11, all those who have gone before uh, in the centuries since then. But let's think a little more personally about it. If I think personally about, about my great cloud of witnesses, I would think, for example, of my youngest brother, John, who finished his race some 34 years ago at the age of 20 and has gone ahead. Or I think about my mom and dad, who are both with the Lord today who model for me what faith looks like and what marriage looks like. I think of so many faithful men and women uh, I've known here at this church over the years, people I consider saints, people who encouraged me and prayed for me as pastor over these now over 36 years. But what about you? Who are the people in your great cloud of witnesses? Maybe a faithful parent, maybe a grandparent, maybe a friend. The author simply wants us to know to remember that none of us run this race of faith alone. We have a great stadium filled with those who've gone before, who set an example for us, who inspire us by their faithfulness, and who are watching, as it were, and cheering us on. And here's another question. Whose cloud are you in right now? Who do you pray for? Who are you encouraging as they run their race of faith? The author is simply saying, remember. Remember, the second thing we see 
in these verses is remove. The word remove. Some of you may know that our own Pastor Bruce McAvoy runs marathons as a hobby. Uh, here he is. Uh, seems like kind of a nutty hobby to me, but that's what he does. In fact, I, I asked him yesterday exactly how many he's run. And Pastor Bruce has run in 33 marathons or ultra marathons. I don't even want to know what that is. In 27 states and on three continents. Back in May, in fact, he and a few friends, some from this church, did something that's even beyond nutty. They, as a fundraiser, did something called the Rim to Rim to Rim Grand Canyon Run. That is, they started at one side, ran all the way down through the canyon, all the way up the other side, then turned around and did it all back over again. It's over 40 miles, and they did it in less than 23 hours. Absolutely amazing accomplishment. But imagine if I ask him to do it again, only this time carrying this 35-pound kettlebell, and I tied his legs together with a bungee cord. I'm not even sure Pastor Bruce would try that, although I might not put it past him to at least try. Listen to these, this verse again. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. I think the author here is talking about two kinds of things that keep us from running this race well. First, he says, lay aside, that is, renounce, uh, put away every weight. Now, the word translated weight here means mass or burden, like this heavy kettlebell, um, or a backpack filled with kettlebells. The author is saying, lay aside excess baggage, the things that we may be dragging around with us, a weight that's counterproductive to the race of faith we're trying to run. Now, I'm not sure here, but I, this weight might not be something that's sinful. We'll talk about sin in just a moment. The weight might just be something, might even be something that people would consider fairly harmless. But spiritually speaking, it might be that which is impeding our progress or, or just slowing us down a little bit, making it more difficult to run, like trying to run a marathon carrying a 35-pound barbell. It could be work. Now, we all know work is good, work is necessary, but work sometimes has a way of spilling over into other parts of our lives. Or maybe anxiety over what's happening in our culture today, politically or socially. Or maybe it's a hobby or interest that's threatening to become a kind of obsession. Social media or Netflix or fantasy football. Sorry to get personal about that. Now, these aren't bad things necessarily, but they may not be the best thing. So consider asking God if there's something, even, even a harmless or good thing, that he's calling you simply to, to lay aside. Secondly, the author says, and sin, which clings so closely. Now, sin is a different matter altogether. The phrase clings so closely can be translated entangles, or that which wraps itself around us and keeps us from running well. Now, I know sin is a very uncomfortable word in our culture. It's a word that our culture hates and tries to avoid. But it's a real word, and I think we all know what sin is. We see it around us all the time, and in fact, we even see it in ourselves. And sin is sin not because God is some kind of old-fashioned prude who doesn't want us to have any fun, Rather, sin is sin because it entangles and it destroys. The writer of Hebrews is saying, if there's something in your life, in your heart, that is causing you to stumble, that's tripping you up, then repent. That is, turn away, confess it, allow it to be removed completely and cut out of your heart and life so you can run. The third thing we see in this passage is run. Run with endurance, the writer says. Many years ago when I was um, working my way through grad school by coaching a basketball at Taylor University in Indiana, the head coach was a man named Paul Patterson who passed away uh, in the last year or so. He's in the Indiana uh, Basketball Coaches Hall of Fame. And every year he would put his players through this grueling month-long conditioning program even before practice began. And one year a new guy came out for the team who um, had played intramurals at the 
university, but never been on the varsity team. Uh, and he was very confident that not only would he make the team, he would become one of the starters on the team. Um, and so he went all the way through the, the month-long conditioning program, uh, all the way until the final day. And the final day every year was uh, something called the 12-minute run. It wrapped up the entire conditioning process. 12-minute run. That doesn't sound that hard, you know, run for 12 minutes, but it's actually way harder than it sounds. The young man started out well. After one lap around the track, he was with the leaders, but by, by about the four-minute mark, he was clearly starting to drag a little bit and drop behind. By about six minutes, he was already a half a lap behind and, and really barely moving, barely putting one foot in front of another. And by about eight minutes into the 12-minute run, he was a, over a full lap behind all the other players. Now, the coach had a standing rule in those days that if you stopped running at any time during the conditioning program or the 12-minute run, you cut yourself. That is, you were no longer on the team. He would say, if you have to get sick, just get sick on the side of the track and keep on moving. Even if you had to walk, keep on moving. Well, about the 9 or 10-minute mark that day, we were watching as, as the young man was way on the far side of the track, and he just stopped. He stopped and started walking back across the field toward where the coach and I were standing. And we looked at each other like, well, uh, what's he going to say? He just, he just decided to cut himself. When he got to us, he was still breathing hard, and he looked at the head coach, and he said, Coach, I've been praying a lot about this lately, and I just don't have any peace about playing ball this year. And without skipping a beat, the coach said, Son, middle of a 12-minute run is no place to be looking for peace. Now, of course, it was important for that young man to pray about whether he should play ball or not. Of course, it was possible that playing basketball was not the right thing for him at that time. But what the coach was saying, and I think this is what Hebrews is telling us, is that just because something is hard doesn't mean it isn't right and good. Sometimes when you feel like quitting, when everything in you wants to stop, you just have to keep on moving. The writer says back in verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which, so easily, which, which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let us run with endurance. What's the race? What does he mean by that? Well, the word, the ancient word uh, translated to race is agon in Greek, from which we get our English word agony, and it means a struggle or a grueling conflict. Now, remember the situation that the author's writing to. These Jewish background followers of Jesus in the first century were struggling. They were in a conflict. They were in a fight. Their race was persecution and suffering and fear and hardship. And the author's just encouraging them, yeah, it's hard, but hang on, don't give up. And now he adds another metaphor, run with endurance. Here's how the Apostle Paul says it in 1 Corinthians. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Now the race here is the challenge that life has set before us right now. More than that, the, the race is faithfulness and endurance in the challenge that life has set before us right now. And for these ancient Hebrew Christians, uh, and for many believers in the world today, it's the threat of persecution. It's the threat of suffering, even death. But what about us? For us, it might just be loss or pain of some kind, fear, maybe doubt, or for some of us, it's simply the many, many distractions in our culture. Wealth, entertainment, comfort. And the point here is the race of faith is long. The race is often hard. And there are times when you just feel like quitting. It requires endurance, the writer says. Now, the word endurance in Greek is the word hupomone, which means to stay under. It's the ability to withstand hardship or adversity, to sustain a prolonged and intense effort. And so where does that kind of endurance come from? How do we keep running when we're weary or tired? Well, the fourth thing we see, I think, in this short passage is to refocus. To refocus, let me read again the whole passage. 
Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, that is, focusing intently on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The writer says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Now, the word founder is a Greek word that simply means leader or captain, one who goes first. So the writer is saying Jesus went first. He's the one that shows us the way of faith, for he trusted the Father. He surrendered himself to his Father's will. And not only is Jesus the, the captain, the founder, the first, he also is the perfecter. That means the finisher of our faith. The writer says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, the whole story arc of the Bible, and this is what we've been seeing all summer, the whole story arc of the Bible from beginning to end is about Jesus. From creation to the fall into sin to the story of Noah, to God's promise to Abraham, to the prophets, to the coming of Jesus, the Messiah, who went to the cross, rose again as the final sacrifice for our sin. All of the story is about Jesus. And what did Jesus cry out on the cross? It is, you can fill in the word, finished. It is finished. The author of Hebrews is writing this letter to say that Jesus is a better way. Jesus is better than any other thing we can attach our hope to. He's greater than the law and the prophets because he finished our salvation. He made the final sacrifice. He is the final sacrifice. But why? Why did he do it? Why was he able to finish the race of faith? Well, here it is. It says it right in the passage. Who for the joy set before him, endured the cross. Jesus endured. Jesus obeyed the Father. Jesus trusted that the end of the race would bring joy. One of my favorite running stories, and I've told this story many times over the years, comes from the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City. A man named John Stephen Aquari was a marathon runner for Tanzania. And about 12 miles into the 26-mile marathon, uh, Aquari fell, stepped in a hole or something, and badly twisted his knee and injured his shoulder. But even though he could barely run, uh, he forced himself to continue to limp along the course. Uh, all the other runners finished. The gold medal was won by a runner from Ethiopia named Mama Walde. Uh, the medal ceremony took place. They played the national anthems, and most of the spectators left the stadium there in Mexico City. Over an hour after the winner had been celebrated, John Aquari finally entered the stadium, bandages on his knee, limping badly, and he made it to the finish line, the last of 57 runners to finish the marathon. And there's no medal for 57th place. When a reporter who was standing by asked him why he bothered to finish when he had no chance of winning or getting any sort of medal, Mr. Aquari said this, and this is the point. He said, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. Faith is like a race, Hebrews is telling us. Some of us are running well. For some of us, the course is smooth and straight, and we feel strong, and we're just running our way along. But the race is not always easy or smooth, is it? There come times when it's difficult or steep, or we just can't quite to see the end in sight. Some of you might be struggling today in some way. Maybe you feel like you're dragging a heavy weight around with you. Maybe it's time to just lay that aside. Maybe it's time to ask for God's help in laying aside that which entangles you. Others of you may just be tired, weary. You can barely put one foot in front of another. But remember, the writer says, you're surrounded by a great cloud of all those who've gone before, who are bearing witness to the faithfulness of Christ, who are bearing witness to the joy that lies ahead, and they're encouraging you, they're cheering you on. 
and your focus is on the one who has gone before you, the one who has finished the course, the one who has finished your salvation, and who promises you his own joy. So, don't give up. Don't lose heart. Set your eyes on the finish line and the one who has already finished and run. Will you bow with me as we close? Lord Jesus, I thank you today for your word. We thank you for this ancient letter written to encourage and strengthen people who, although they live long ago and in a different time, a different culture, they're just like us because we too sometimes struggle with faith. Help us remember all those who've gone before, those who are faithful witnesses who encourage and cheer us on. Help us to, that whenever, wherever we are in our race of faith, to fix our eyes on you and to focus on the joy to set before us and to finish well. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Receive now today's benediction. May we go now in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who is constant, who is good, and never for a moment does he forsake you.